Okay, let's get started. Welcome back everyone to day two of Data Carpentry. My name is Madeline. I am a PhD student in biology, well, sorry, physics, biophysics. Um, I research bacteria and viruses. I use Python all the time in my research. I started using Python when I started grad school and it was sort of like my supervisor just said, oh, why don't you use Python? And I said, okay. And then I proceeded to <laughs> painfully and horribly learn Python alone <laughs> in my office. Um, and it was, it was, if I look back at what I wrote then, I feel embarrassed for myself and sad for what I had to learn alone. So I think all of you are doing a great thing by being here. Um, also, I think Python is super amazing and cool and I'm really excited about it and I'm really happy that we're all learning Python. Um, in particular though, what we're gonna talk about today, so yesterday we talked about things like Python syntax and the Jupyter Lab, Jupyter Notebook environment um, and uh, data frames in pandas. Today we're going to talk a lot about visualizations, so data visualizations and making plots, which I'm even more excited about because plots are very cool. And Python, you can make like any kind of plot you can imagine. Um, so I should say though that Seaborn, which is the package we're going to be mostly using, uh, at least for the first part, is pretty. It's a it's a plotting package in Python, but I'm, it's pretty new to me. So we're gonna. I'm going to try to remember that if I'm confused, then you're probably also confused and vice versa. So uh, don't, don't be afraid to stop me and say, like, that doesn't make sense and we'll figure it out together. Um, I just wanted to show you before we start um, some plots. Can I do this? I have to run full screen. OK, so I, if you Google something like Python plot gallery, you can find something like this. This is actually a Seaborn plot gallery. So these plots are all made using the package that we're going to be talking about this morning. As you can see, they're very nice. You could put these in a paper and nobody would be mad at you. Um, you can also look at kind of, there's lots of plotting packages. So Seaborn is one of them. Um, this is a more kind of general Python plot gallery. Um, and these links are in, in the lesson material as well. This is pretty cool. Yeah, so I just want to, to show you that you can make anything, you should be inspired. Um, yeah, so let's uh, let's go into our notebook now, and I'm going to do a little review of yesterday what we did, just to kind of get us all on the same page. So um, put up your blue sticky if you are looking at your Jupyter notebook or Jupyter lab. OK, awesome. And I just want to remind you, again, that the code for today is linked on the website and on the Etherpad, so you can follow along there. Um, OK, so yesterday we did stuff like um, slicing inside lists. We talked about different data types. So let's make a list, um, call it data, because most of my data lists are called data, which is very creative. And make it with some numbers. Again, uh, you can do shift enter, or I think control enter just runs that cell. Shift enter will run the cell and then put you into the next cell below. You can slice uh, to get certain elements from a list by using square brackets and then numbers. So if you do uh, data one, who can tell me which number this is going to return? Two. Two. Yes, trick question, because Python index can start at zero. Um, I use MATLAB. Does anyone use MATLAB? So I came from MATLAB before I used Python, and I was so confused by this. Maybe you are feeling the pain. Um, because Mat uh, MATLAB indexing starts at 1, so it was uh, tough to switch. You can do stuff like uh, use a colon. This will give you the first uh, three elements, but it's up to but not including the thing that's indexed with three. So this is 0, 1, and 2. Uh, you can get the last element. Who remembers how to get the last element? Minus 1. Minus one. This is extremely useful. Um, I do this kind of thing all the time, like data minus 3 colon, to get like the last couple of lines in something. This is sort of like the tail command in pandas, but if you're not using pandas, this is a very kind of general Python way to do it. Um, you can also reassign things in a list. So you can do something like data, make the last element 
minus five, let's say, with a single equal sign. Okay, so that was a bunch of stuff about lists. Uh, we also talked about the markdown cell. So I don't know if, did we talk about the shortcut to get like a code cell and markdown cell? I just find this very handy. So if you're if you're inside a cell, like your cursor is in the cell, uh, and you hit escape, it'll go into what's called command mode. So you're no longer, you don't see a cursor anymore. And then you can use uh, various keys to change the cell type. So if you hit Y, it'll become a code cell again. And then if you hit M, it becomes a markdown cell. And then if you hit enter, you're back in the cell. <coughs> so escape and enter to switch back and forth, and then Y and M to switch the cell type. So we also talked about yesterday um, if statements. So let's say I have a string, which is a list of characters. Name. There it is. OK, let's, uh, I'm going to talk about, this is not a function we talked about, but it's just a short one. Um, so the function len, L-E-N, gives you the length of a thing that has a length. So you can do a length of a string or a list or something like that or a dictionary. Um, so let's make a loop and see um, if my name is short enough to be my Twitter name. Uh, so if my name is uh, greater than 20, let's print something. This name used to be too long for a Twitter name. I discovered when I changed my name. OK, so we talked about uh, else, but there's also something called L if, which is like a combination of else and if. So it's it has the same syntax as the if line, but it's like saying, if the first line is not true, then go into this next if statement. So then let's do another check. If when my name. Uh, greater than 50, and this name is too long for a Twitter name. You can put your own name here, by the way. <laughs> you don't have to say my name. Um, and then finally, we can do else. And because this is else, this will cover every case that wasn't hit by the first two. We don't need to have anything, like, we don't have to say any condition in this line here. You can just say else. Print this name is not too long for Twitter. Okay, uh, let's run this and see if my name is too long for Twitter. Okay, it used to be too long. Yeah, so it's more than twenty. So um, that's an example of how you can use conditional logic to. Uh, execute a different outcome depending on some check on a variable. So you can make this a different string or something like that. Uh, we talked about using uh, comparisons like greater than or less than uh, in pandas data frames to kind of select different rows. Another thing that we talked about was importing packages. So let's import pandas and numpy, which are two things we'll use today. And again, uh, pandas and numpy are the full name of the package. And these are already installed, so I don't need to do anything with the internet. But then uh, we can give them a nickname, like PD or MP, just so we don't have to type as much. Um, the number 10 here means that it's run. The asterisk meant that it was still running. OK, uh, we talked about loading data into a pandas data frame. So let's now load the surveys data. And this is the beginning of the things that you should uh, if you've just been listening to my review, you should start typing now because this is uh, what we're going to use for the actual lesson. pd.read csv. So if you saved it as uh, surveys.csv, you can just type this. If you didn't, you can do uh, you can copy the link from the Etherpad, which is. Is that the same one from yesterday? It's the same one from yesterday. Yeah. So if you already have it, you can either you can either copy the code from yesterday or copy the link. I'm going to use the link. 
Yeah. Is there a way to include quotes within a string? Ah, good question. Yeah, so you can uh, include the other kind of quote that you didn't use. So if I did something like this, or if I had like my nickname, like these will show up as quotes. Um, so you could, if you want to do double quotes, you could start with single quotes. See so now this is no longer inside the same string. If I did this, those double quotes will now be in the string. Yeah. Okay, cool, good question. I'm running this to load the survey data set. Um, we learned some handy, sorry, yes. Do I have to be consistent with quotes throughout the complete code or no. only within the command? Only within that string. So you'll probably notice me switch them up by accident. Like I just, yeah. sometimes I feel like I want to use single quotes. I don't know, I can't tell why I use one or the other. It just happens, but yeah. You can't do like one, you'll notice if you start typing it, it'll often give you the matched ending. But if you have like one and then the mismatched one, it's so hard to type. This will give you some sort of error. But yeah, you can switch them up throughout your document, yeah. Cool. Um, let's do surveys.info. So this tells you about uh, the columns and what's in them, how many rows there are, uh, what type of object it is. So we have surveys.info. We also have describe. Um, in my mind, these are very similar meanings, so I can't remember what the difference is, but you would find out pretty quickly by trying it. Um, this is nice. Okay, so basically it takes all of the uh, numerical columns and gives us lots of statistics. So all of these things here for each of the ones that had numbers in them, each of the columns. Well, can you pull up the yeah, um, to this one? Okay. Um, put up your blue sticky if you have loaded the survey's data set and pandas and NumPy. Okay. Okay. Um, do you guys want, yeah, can one of the helpers maybe just make sure that you got the data loaded? One that I like a lot is dot columns, which gives you a list of all of the columns in your data frame. Um, this came up yesterday, the question of which things uh, have parentheses like this and which things don't. And Francis answered it well. Basically, the things that have parentheses are functions that belong to that object. So they're doing some sort of code behind in the background. Um, it's also called a method. If it's a like dot thing, it's known as a method. If there's no parentheses, it's like a, a number that already exists or a, a thing that already exists attached to that object. So this is what's called an attribute. Um, and as, as for which is which, I don't think there's a good way to remember. I think you just have to like look it up. I constantly mess them up. Yeah. Um, okay, so pandas is also kind of new to me. So I maybe like within the last couple of weeks actually have felt like I've understood how to select things from data frames. So I'll go over it again just because it's it confused me a lot. So I want to make sure that we are on the same page. So we have the survey's data frame. Can anyone tell me how to select um, columns? Columns by, by themselves, like all the rows and then a few columns. Yep, yeah, that works. Uh, brackets. So, okay. So now, if I wanted to just just get say weight and species columns, how would I do that? First, put a colon, and then bracket again, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. This. Awesome, okay, that worked. So another way to do the same thing would be to do, I'm not gonna run this, I'll just type it for you. So 
So if you're just selecting columns, you can give them just within the square brackets. Um, if you, basically the reason why there's two square brackets is that this inner thing can be either a single item, like a single column name, or a list of column names. And if it's a list, it's gonna be enclosed in the square brackets. Um, you could have just one thing in the square brackets as well. So let's, let's scroll down. Oh man, it's so long, okay. If you did surveys, great. This will be fine as well, even though you don't need the inner square brackets. I think just to, for myself, I like to do it always with two square brackets just to not confuse myself. Okay, how about selecting rows? What if I want uh, just the first row? Ah, love it. Oh, maybe one. Okay, cool. Yeah, that works. Uh, how about another way? Any other suggestions? There's often many ways to do it. And uh, just uh, one. One? Uh, zero, zero column, one. Okay, hold on. Zero column. Zero column, one. Like that. Okay, yeah. I think we could probably also do zero. Oh no, we can't. So, I think, again, it has to be a slice or a list if it's just uh, inside the single bracket. So if you did go on to do just zero, I think it has to be like this. Let's see if this works. No, okay. I think we need to use that look for rows. This works though, let's leave this. Oh, so now we have two methods of getting the first row that both give the same thing. Um, so, Dot, there's dot loc, so we, we have this thing where we can slice without loc or iloc, uh, we can use head. Um, using dot loc, the important thing to remember is that you have to supply the rows you wanna take and then the columns, so like rows comma columns, and they can be a slice of things or a list of things, or if you wanna get say all the rows, like Paula said, you can just use a colon to select everything. So let's say you wanna do, let's do something that's like, uh, a little interesting. This is something that I think is pretty cool is you can use the column names to slice between two columns. Like let's say we want to get everything between sex and genus. You can do sex colon genus inside dot loc. And then it gives you all the columns between sex and genus. Um, this is a little confusing to me is that this is now inclusive on both ends. I'm like list slicing. So that's just a, a thing, I guess. Um, it has everything up to including both the beginning and the end. Why do we have to have a comma? Before? This comma? Yeah. So yeah, the dot loc wants to get all of the rows that you want and then all the columns. So it's like rows, comma, columns. So here by with, with the colon, it's just saying everything, like all rows. You could say take the first five, Um, the thing to remember though too with loc is that in this case, the index is actually labeling things starting at zero and going to the end, but the index could be something else. It could be like an ID or it could be a date or it could be like a string. In which case with dot loc, you'd have to actually supply that the name of the index. So if you had say no row that was indexed with one, then uh, if you tried to do loc one, it would give you an error because that index label is not in the thing. Um, this is confusing to me. If you want to just get the first five rows, regardless of what they're labeled, you can use iloc. And the difference between loc and iloc is, again, exactly that loc takes uh, the specific labels of the index of the rows and of the columns, and iloc takes their kind of numbered location. So to do the same thing, to get the same result as here, we can use zero to five for the rows, but then we'd have to know what, uh, which columns these are. So maybe it's like five to nine. I don't actually know. 
but this will give us the fifth column to the ninth column if I run this. Okay, close. It's actually six to ten. Any questions about loc and iloc slicing? Um, another thing you can do when you're selecting rows and columns is use those comparison operators to get subsets that match your criteria. So if we do, yeah. Uh, just a remark that uh, when you use the, the block, uh, it was inclusive for G of genus. Yeah. And when you use the I block, the column number 10 is the next one. Mm. So. Yeah, good point. So the whole inclusive exclusive thing. It's inclusive with these labels, but not with the numbered indices. So I guess you can just know that whenever you're giving like indices to slice, they will be exclusive of the end and inclusive of the beginning. That is a subtle point. Thank you. Okay, so let's say we want to get everything that is in the taxa rodent, and that is female in the sex female. Okay. So to dot loc, you can pass basically a list of indices that you get using this comparison operator. So actually, before we do that, let's first look at what we get if you do surveys taxa. So this will select the, the taxa column equals rodent. The double equal sign is comparing if these two things are the same. Let's run this. So you get basically a list or series object that's just a list of true or false if it matches. And if you pass that thing back to surveys in the load command, you can it'll just give you everything that matches true and not the ones that match false. So let's uh, write this out now in here. Surveys. I'm gonna put brackets around this because I wanna do more things. We have one thing where tax equals rodent, and then we use ampersand to uh, add another comparison. And, and I can hit enter because because it's in uh, brackets, Python will know that it's part of the same line. Oh no, I hit insert. Um, oh no, that's not actually a thing, that'll be F. And then let's just look at the taxa and sex columns. So now, okay, so now in .loc, we have a bunch of stuff that's gonna select some rows, and then we can put a comma to select some columns. So now we can pass a list of the columns we want. Uh, in this case, we'll do taxa and sex. And as to your earlier question about the quotes, you could just, make one of these in different quotes and it would still work. For consistency, I will not, but you could. Okay, let's run this. Okay. Now we got only the things, only the records where rodent, tax was rodent and sex was female. And uh, we could add something else on here like dot head to just get the first five lines. Any questions about that? Um, when I look at something like this, it seems like a lot of, it's like hard to kind of parse when I first look at it. It helps me to kind of remember what, okay, what does dot loc actually take as its parameters? Okay, we have some rows, and then we have some columns. And now this result is a new data frame, and then we're going to do dot head on it. So kind of just to try to say it out like that. Last thing in the recap before we start talking about plots, uh, we talked about group by. Um, Yellow sticky. So uh, group by, I also found super confusing at first. Let's make a new thing called group surveys. This part. 
Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, this part, sorry, this recap part is not in the notes. I can copy the rest of the recap part into the paper pad in the breaks. Okay, we talked about group by. So let's do uh, make a group surveys object, surveys.group by. And to group by, you can pass uh, a list or a single column uh, that has categor categorical variables in it that you want to group your data by. So let's do two. We'll do species six. So it was hard for me to understand what group, group I was doing because when you look at this thing, this group surveys, like if we just print this now or run this, it's sort of a, it's like a, I don't know, abstract's not the right word. It's like a, a hidden object that you don't get to see what's actually in there. You have to now uh, select some data from it and do some operation to actually see what group I is doing. So um, this is, I think, unfortunate, but that's just the way it is. So from this object, this grouped object. Even now, I think actually you still don't get something that looks nice. Yeah, you have to do something like mean. The whole point of group by is that you want to perform some operation on groups, so you need to actually do something uh, to get some results. Now we have uh, grouped by species and sex, the mean for each of these things. Um, the order in which you specify these things will specify, will change the order in which they're grouped. You can try this and see that if you switch species and sex, you'll have sex and then species. Um, the results, the numbers will all be the same, but it's just kind of a presentation thing. Um, you can use the dot ag function. So. Group surveys, uh, sorry, select the weight column again, dot ag. So dot ag allows you to do any function as your kind of operation on your grouped data and not just a pipe or a pandas function. So you can use, say, uh, the numpy function standard deviation. Um, and then you get instead of mean, standard deviation for all those things. Are there any questions about group by? Uh, we'll keep using group by, so if you have more questions, that's okay. We'll come up again. Okay, so that is the end of the recap. Now let's start talking about plots. So like I said at the beginning, uh, you can make tons of different plots in Python. Um, we're gonna talk about today two packages, matplotlib and seaborn. These are two of the most common plotting packages. I uh, almost exclusively use matplotlib, um, but Seaborn is, is really, really great for data that's in kind of a data frame structure. So if you have categorical variables like species or things like that, uh, Seaborn allows you to very quickly explore the relationships between all these categorical variables. It's like the, the visual version of group by kind of, so you can group things differently and then uh, look at them, and then you're, you can change the plot type really easily without too much effort. And the nice thing is that the defaults also look very nice, so you can, uh, like in a few lines, make a plot that you can put in the paper. Um, so we're going to do all that. It's going to be great. Um, but I just wanted to show you a plot that I made a couple of days ago because I want to just yeah emphasize that this is something that I use all the time, matplotlib specifically. So this is a plot. That's the less interesting one. This one. I made these in matplotlib. Um, this is a simulation that I made. Uh, there's viruses and bacteria, and they're mutating, and it's really cool. So yeah, um, I love plotting in Python. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd be happy to show you my other plots later. OK. Um, OK, I have to go back to the notes. <coughs> OK, so we have our service data set. Uh, let's import the Seaborn package. So this is something we did yesterday, especially in the morning, we briefly went over Seaborn. Again, 
Uh, SNS is the kind of conventional nickname for it. You could call it anything you want, like plotting thing. Don't do that because it's long. Um, and often there is a convention for what this nickname is, in this case, SNS. So let's, uh, let's make a plot of the number of species, a number of each species in the data frame. So there's a, a function called count plot. Um, and let's specify the variable to go on the, the vertical axis will be species. And then we have to tell it which data to use. In this case, we're going to use the survey's data frame. SNS.countPlot and then y equals species. Because it's just counting things, we only need one uh, variable. We don't have to have like also x. So let's run this. Oh, I forgot something. Does anyone know what I forgot? Uh, a sort of strange command. Yeah. Yes. So this may have worked for you without this. I guess my version doesn't. So this is um, like a percent symbol, matplotlib inline. Um, this thing now is not, it's not actually showing yet. So if I run this first, it's matplotlib inline, now it'll uh, show me the plot in my notebook. Ah, there we go. <coughs> so put up your blue sticky if uh, you have a plot visible that looks like this. Yeah, do you have a question? Oh, uh, no, I, I just I didn't have to do that. Math. Oh, you didn't have to do it. Okay. Yeah, so maybe if your version is newer, you don't have to do that. Yeah. Okay. So uh, since there's so many here that are very low numbers, let's take just say the first four uh, most common to, to plot from now on. So let's make... Uh, Let's see how many there are of each species using a function called value counts. <laughs> now, uh, value counts will tell us the number in each, uh, each unique thing in the species column. Okay, so the top four are Mariami, Penis, Salata, Spordaea, and Balei. Um, can anyone think of another way that I could have gotten the same information? Um, I'll give you a hint. It involves group by and a command that you talked about <coughs> yesterday. Hmm? I heard something. Uh, so would it be like survey species and largest? So like this. Um, okay. I'm not sure what the syntax is for nlarges. Does anyone remember? Right, so I'm missing a missing another here. So if I group by species and then do something like size, I think that's going to work. Yeah. So here we get the same information, um, more or less, in two different ways. Well, cool. okay. So uh, we want to make, sorry, did you have a question? We want to make a new data frame that just has the top four species. Um, does anyone have an idea of how we could do that? Let's go down. So the top four species, again, just copy these. These are my top four species that I want to select. Uh, 
is equal this. <coughs> and then uh, or Okay, this looks like it's gonna work. Oops, not this. It's and then another or. This is the vertical bar means or. Surveys, species. Oops. Or, or last one. <coughs> Hard to remember where these brackets go. Okay, and if everything went well and I made no typos. Okay, let's do Let's add a dot head on the end here. Okay, I think that probably worked. So that's great. Um, but you can imagine if I wanted to take, if I changed my mind, I wanted the first 10 species. Now my life has become miserable because now I have to type six more species. So there's probably a better way, or maybe a, not better, a, way that is more extendable to get this kind of result. Let's make a list of the indices. So basically going back to what we did before with the value counts, let's make a list of those species that are the n largest. So uh, let's do surveys. Species. Dot value counts. Okay. I'm going to put this in a bracket so we can do on multiple lines. <coughs> and then we can do dot and largest and give it however many we want to take. And now suddenly this is great because now if I change my mind later and I want to take six or ten, I can just change this number instead of having to type out a bunch more names. Uh, let's see what this looks like first. Okay, so now we want to use this as an index to get to pass back to the survey's data frame. So now let's add on here dot index. Now we have as a an object just the index of these four things. And we can make this assign this to a variable. Let's call it most common species equals that thing. Now if I run this instead of getting that output, it'll just assign it to the variable most common species. If I want to still look at it, I can just type it at the bottom. Most common species. Okay, so I have three M's in common. That is my problem. So put up your blue sticky if you have most common species now with four things. I hear lots of typing, so I'll give it a second. And now that we have this, we can use a function called uh, isIn to check if the row that we're looking at is in this list of indices, and then just return that. Surveys.loc again. Uh, and now we want to do that the species is in, you can kind of read this like a sentence, this list most common species. Let's assign this to uh, a new variable called survey is common. Okay. 
And if you look at something like the shape of surveys, and then the shape of surveys common, we can see that we have subsetted it. So we're now uh, about half as much data. We've lost about half the data. So now let's make a count plot of this smaller data frame. SMS.countplot, open parentheses, y equals species, same as before. For now, we're going to pass data equals surveys common instead of surveys. Put up your blue sticky if you are at the same step. It'll be yellow sticky if you have a bug. Okay. So maybe we look at this and you think, okay, this font size is a bit too small. Um, there is a way to change that. So let's change something called the context. We'll change like the global uh, settings for the font size. So do that, it's sns.set underscore context, open parentheses. Context equals notebook. So there's a few different options for context. I think they're like um, talk, paper, that kind of thing. So you can, uh, it probably has some sort of group of parameters that you can change like the font and the font size. It'll look nice in that kind of document. So in this case, we're working in a notebook. We want it to look nicer in notebooks. We can make the context notebook. And let's also change the font size. So we're gonna scale it as a multiple of the default. So 1.4 will be a little bit bigger than the default. And then if we, again, make this count plot. There we go. Now the font size is a nice, a nice look for this plot. Um, you can do things like change Y to X to make it uh, vertical bars instead of horizontal bars. Which is handy. Okay, so maybe counting is not all you want to do. Maybe you want to look at something more interesting, like uh, some statistics of the data in each of these groups. So let's make a box plot. Any guesses as to what the command for box plot is? You can guess. Box plot. Box plot. Yay. Um, for being new to Seaborn, for, for me anyway, the nice thing is that some of these are kind of intuitive, like what they're called. So if you, you're like, oh, how do I make a blank plot in Seaborn? Often it's like SNS dot that plot. OK, so now we're going to make a box plot, so we want to have uh, one of the numerical variables and then one of the categorical variables. So let's do um, weight on the x-axis. So this is now a range of numbers and then y will be species still. We still have to tell it what data frame to work with. Ooh, nice. um, you could say Maybe you think that these bars are too tall. You can change the width. Um, it's called width just because if you oriented it the other way, it would still be width. Width equals zero point. And now they're a little skinnier. So um, what you'll notice is that the syntax here is, is very similar to count plot. Like if you just change this to count plot, uh, it would still work. You might have to take off this width thing. But the nice thing is that if you suddenly change your mind, you're like, oh my goodness, no, I wanted a violin plot, then you can basically leave everything the same and just change the plot type. So you can decide how you're going to arrange your data and which variables you want to compare and then change the plot type pretty easily. Um, by default, this is a, what's called a two-key box plot. 
um, which I'm, I'm not super familiar with because I don't use box plots in my own research, but basically these lines are various percentiles in the data. Um, I think this middle line is the median, and then these ones here, the dots are like the outliers from the 25th and 75th percentile. Um, you can change the colors of things, you can change other things, yeah. How do you get the data from this plot? The, like the data points? So, I mean, the data is the underlying data in surveys common. So if you wanted to know um, by species what these data are, you could just do surveys common species. Uh, I mean, uh, species. The, the results that are displaying is there any way to show the data points on the graph? Oh, like actually label them with data? Yes. Um, there almost certainly is. I'm not sure like, if you wanted to add numbers for each of these or like hover over not them and show the numbers. Oh. Yeah, do you know if there's an easy way to do that in Seaborn, like label the, the means and stuff? Well, the actual value of the mean in the top, you have to annotate it, and you use, it's not like this parameter is there, you have to annotate it manually, and you have to come out to the things like that in the next lecture, but not annotate the values per se. But it's a new plot that takes object on that position. Yeah, so um, you can make an object called like the axis that, that governs this figure, and then you can add all kinds of stuff to it. Like manually. And you could say, like, you could give it, okay, I, I know the mean is, I won't do it, but you know what this value is from the data frame. You can just tell it to put a certain text there in an arrow or something like that. Yeah, the thing about plotting um, is that you can do anything that you want. It can be, it can get like tricky. So, um, yeah, sometimes if you want to do very custom things, it's always possible. It's never impossible, but it can be like quite a rabbit hole of various threads online to figure out how to do it. But yeah, good question. So, um, like I said, you can change the plot type easily. This is a box plot. Let's make a violin plot. So now stop violin plot. I really like violin plots. I think they look awesome. And you'll notice again, this is the exact same syntax inside this function call. So you could literally just copy your command from above and change box plot to violin plot. So this is. Um, Violin plots are nice because a box plot doesn't show you things like if there's multi multiple modes in distribution. So the violin plot is like a, I think it's using kernel density estimates to make a smooth histogram of your data. And then inside here, by default, it's showing you some of your data points. Um, I think these are like the percentiles and the median and stuff like that. Yeah, the median is the white dot. You can change though what this inner thing looks like. You can make it a scatter plot of the points. Uh, you can make it different things you want. So uh, maybe you don't, you're not a huge fan of these colors. You can change the color scheme with the command palette. So um, I don't remember any of these things. I always just look them up. Like I Google matplotlib color maps like three times a day. Um, so you can just look up like what are the Seaborn palettes. That's nice. The nice thing about that is that it's, um, different color, but also different lightness. So you can actually, this will still look good in black and white or to colorblind. So you can look up, there's lots of stuff online about like what's good for colorblind viewing or print viewing and things like that in terms of colors. You can change the color. Okay, I'm just gonna copy this and then change one of the commands. So you can change this in the same line if you want. Um, instead of palette, we can change the entire color to something like light gray. Now they're all the same color, okay? Um, I think, I'm not so, I'm not positive, but I think you can pass a list to color that has the same number of things as the number of, of plots and it can just color each of them a different thing. Let's try it really quick. Uh, you don't have to do this, but you can if you want. Okay, maybe not. 
Yeah, I might have, I probably just used this. It works, okay. Okay, yeah, so for palette, um, you can use one of the pre-named palettes or you can sp supply like a list of colors. Um, I like to color my plots manually, so I always do stuff like this where I just supply my own list, but it's up to you. So now um, we're gonna keep working with, with violin plots for a bit, um, just to kind of go through like a, a kind of example of how you would use this kind of plotting to explore relationships in your data. So uh, put up a blue sticky if I can scroll past this. Yeah. Is there any guide to knowing when to use map plot versus seaborn? Or can somebody get by knowing this one? Some people say seaborn one two. Yeah, so I like I mean before this I only use Matplotlib. So I would say Matplotlib is sort of like it's it's a little lower level, so it's it's sort of like you're saying, okay, take these points and make them blue and take these points and make them red. Whereas Seaborn is like color the data by species. So it's a little more intuitive and high level in that way. Um, but you can do everything and you can make the same plot in that problem. It would just probably take many more lines because you'd have to say like, okay, the data that matches this, I'm gonna plot it here and then plot the next data here and make it this color. That kind so of thing. Data, you don't use I don't, but again, I, I don't typically work with data that's like a spreadsheet. So if you are, if you have data that's set up like a pandas data frame, um, it does make sense to use Seaborn. So actually I think I did I once, yeah, if I if I had data that was like a spreadsheet, I would use Seaborn, yeah. I think my relationship paper actually has a Seaborn plot. I shouldn't say that. So yeah, it's it's. I think it more depends on how your data is set up and how you want to think about plotting it. Um, if it's just a bunch of numbers that you want to plot a line, matplotlib is probably the way to go. But yeah, um, I think, well, we're talking about matplotlib more this afternoon, and I think you'll see kind of the difference in how to think about plotting, yeah. Good question. Yeah, sorry. Do you want to ask a question? No, I'm good. Okay. All right. So let's make another box plot. Um, and this will be an example of where a box plot might confound uh, some multimodal distributions. So uh, here I didn't include spaces. It's kind of nice to have the spaces because it's more readable, but you don't need them. Okay, so from this you would not necessarily know uh, anything about what these distributions look like or how these points are grouped. You know what these percentiles are, but you don't know if there's like a bunch on the left and then a bunch on the right. So let's change this to a violin plot. Now you can really clearly see that there are a few different groups of distributions in some of these data sets. So um, if you were looking at data like this and you wanted to know, okay, maybe there's some other categorical variable that explains these distributions. So we have, so we, all we're looking at on the y-axis is plot type, but there's lots of other variables. There's species, there's genus, there's sex. So we can try to explore those and see if any of them explain why the distributions have multiple modes. Uh, so let's look at um, what are the different, uh, like how many different factors there are in each of our columns. I'm just going to copy this as a comment so you can still see it. That's the plot. So let's do surveys common uh, dot n unique and dot sort values. Okay, so we're looking for things that we don't want something like record ID because there's not 20,000 different bumps in our data. I mean, on some level, yes. Um, weight and nine foot length are numbers, so we probably don't want to look at those. But then in things like species and sex and genus, these are lower numbers and they're categorical variables, so they might be the thing we're after. So, um, 
Seaborn has a really handy plot uh, command to kind of group things by different variables like that. It's called factor plot. SNS.factorplot. Um, let's do, we'll do the same thing. Like we'll have X being weight and Y being plot type, but then we can specify how to split or color the data differently based on these other categorical variables. And by now you're seeing that we're typing like the exact same first couple of commands. All that's changing is a few parameters after. So now we're gonna pass this, this argument column equals sex. So this will divide the data into two groups based on sex. And because we didn't specify what kind of plot other than that it's gonna be a plot based on different factors, we can say now kind equals violin. Neat, okay, so this is uh, very similar to what we had above, except for now it's split by sex. We have F and M here, um, although we still have these multiple bumps, so maybe that's, there's more things. So we can add more factors and split into more things. So we had another thing that had two uh, different types, that was genus. So let's, I'm gonna type the exact same thing, so, oops. Okay. So that's our factor plot. You can copy and paste if you like. I'm going to type it. X equals weight, Y equals plot type, data equals surveys common, call equals sex. Now we can add row and include a different uh, column name here to split by. And let's do kind equals violin again. Last one is margin titles equals true. So some of these parameters, they'll take a Boolean like true or false. This just means that it's gonna add labels to the plot. Uh, you'll see where, yeah, like here. So uh, because my screen is big, you can't see, but put your blue sticky up if you see a four panel plot. Okay, I see mostly blue. So now this is pretty good. Like at least in this top row, we got mostly unimodal distributions. Uh, down here, though, there's clearly still multiple modes. So we had one last thing. Um, let's look at what we've got going on for species. We'll group by species. Uh, let's group by genus and species. We can use dot size to see how many there are of each one. So there's uh, decent numbers of each one, so it's possible that those would be enough to make different clusters. So let's uh, split the subsplit the genus gen genera genera by uh, species. Our factor plot again. So I'm doing these all on different lines um, because we're kind of going through this together. But if I was doing this myself, I would probably be doing like the same command and modifying it and like redoing it over and over. So your own workflow, probably you won't, the nice thing is you won't have to type X equals weight, Y equals plot type over and over because you'd just be modifying the same command. So it looks like it's a lot of effort right now, but the point is that a lot of these things are staying the same. Now let's split it by species instead of by genus. Um, a fun thing to do too, 
is to just try taking out parameters and seeing how it breaks. Sometimes it'll just be a blank image with no data. Um, it'll kind of help you get an idea of what each of these things is doing. Cool, okay, so mostly unimodal, this is good. Um, this kind of makes sense to me, like it seems like species should be the thing that is most similar in terms of weight, other than say plot type. Um, we can move the columns around though. So before we had a uh, two by two, because we had two different factors that we could specify column and rub, we can also just say, move the two on the right to the bottom using a command called call wrap, call wrap. Um, Another thing I should mention is the order of these uh, arguments does not matter because you're saying something equals something. So you could also, um, many functions allow you to just put things in the right order. Like if you took off, say, x equals and y equals, this would still work. But when you specify like data equals something, then you can mix the order around and it will still know which one's which. Uh, we'll add one more aspect equals. 1.4 aspect. Nice. Okay. So now we have just split by species, but we've made it look nicer because it's uh, split over two rows. Last thing we can add, and then we'll take a break. Um, we can add a parameter hue, which will color it by a different one of our variables. So let's add hue equals sex. I'm gonna move these to individual rows so you can see them. Now each of the violins has been split into two uh, colored by sex. Okay, this looks good. I think we've got most of our distributions looking unimodal. One final prettification thing. Let's add the argument split equals true. And now each violin plot is split down the middle and the top half is one sex and the bottom half is the other sex. So now it's a little easier to look at and very nice. I'll uh, put up your blue sticky if you're looking at this. Okay, let's do a combined challenge and break, and we'll take the new equals sex. Hue equals sex. So this means color it by sex. So if I scroll down a little bit, you'll see the colors are determined by the sex variable. So um, earlier, uh, did, we, did we use hue yet? Basically, you can color it by, you could say hue equals species, and it would instead color it by species. Let's see if this works. No, it doesn't work. What does what do? It's split. So split um, makes each of these violin plots into, before it was like a blue violin and an orange violin. Mm -hmm. And now it's the blue and the orange are in the same kind of group. They're just split like top and bottom. And if I put the hue or by sex, but without the split, what do I get? Yeah, let's do it. So it's now, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's sort of like saying, okay, since these are actually just symmetric violins, we can just take off the bottom half of one and the top half of the other and smoosh them together. It just makes it a little bit less cluttered. And this is nice. You could probably uh, do a few things, like maybe change this label to be capital with a space, but then you'd be ready to publish it like that. Okay, let's do a challenge and a break. Um, so when I got to the end here, I kind of thought, okay, I'm not convinced that plot type is even that big of an effect on this, because if you look across the same species for plot type, it doesn't seem like it's having that much of an effect. So let's make a simpler plot, uh, make a violin plot of species on the y-axis and weight on the x-axis, and but split down the middle by sex and colored by sex like this. Mm 
And uh, this last part is bonus. So if you, if you feel like it, go ahead. Uh, make a new data frame that has the fifth and sixth most largest species as well. So instead of the four most common species, make it the six most common species. So I'll leave you with that and let's return at uh, 1040. So 25 minutes and there's coffee. Okay, before um, I take up the challenge, I just wanted to um, mention one more thing about the relationship between Seaborn and Matplotlib. So back to your, one of the questions. Um, Seaborn is actually using Matplotlib underneath. So it's, it's working on top of Matplotlib. So we'll see in a minute actually how you can still access kind of Matplotlib underneath. You can use any Matplotlib functionality still within Seaborn because they're kind of just, Seaborn is like a, a, a higher level layer on top of Matplotlib. Yeah. Um, and I also want to just reiterate that it's easy to change like the plot type. So remember this was a violin plot. We could just change the kind here to say point. And then I think we probably want a few different parameters. So we don't need this one anymore. Um, we can add one that's join equals false dodge equals 1.25. I think dodge um, slightly jitters the points so they don't sit right on top of each other. So let's try this. This is exactly the same as the violin plot, just changing two of the parameters in the kind. Now it looks totally different. So you can you can set or you can decide upon how you want to structure your visualization, and then you can change the way it looks pretty easily with Seaborn. So that's kind of the, the appeal, mostly. Okay, let's go back to the challenge. So at the end here, you might look at this and think, okay, well, it looks like actually the plot type isn't a huge impact on these distributions on the weight. So let's go back and just look at uh, everything combined instead of plot type. So um, who wants to tell me, who wants to share their solution for plotting a violent plot of species versus weight? That's a nice violent plot. I see weight by equal species. You equal sex. Okay. Nice, yeah, so now we have everything that was in one of the panels before is now in a single violin plot. And this is pretty nice. And this is actually the same box plot we made at the very beginning, if you remember. So if I scroll all the way back to the top, the first thing we did was plot <laughs> plot this. So, I mean, maybe this is a lesson in data exploration that often you might come back to your first idea. Um, who wants to, anyone who tried the bonus, uh, do you want to share what you did for that? Uh, oh, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. Actually, I, I did this plot uh, twice, uh, once using a violin plot, other using vector plot and kind of violin. Yeah, and so more like this. Yeah, okay, let's try uh, doing this and not spreading it. It could be something to do with just the way that the plot area is. So if we do this, take off species, make this species instead. This. Let's see. Yeah, so we get, you could do it with factor plot as well, except for now we're not actually putting in different factors. Um, here, I'll put these two codes side by side. Yeah, so these two things do basically the same thing. Uh, this aspect thing, I think, just changes how wide or, or tall your thing is. Does that... Does, yeah, because I had removed this aspect and then I'm 
Okay. Yeah. So I think you can change things like, yeah, the width and the height. So can you put, can I see the code? Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Yeah, leave that there for a second. Um, okay, so the second part of the bonus was to, instead of plotting the first four most common species, mm -hmm. plot the first six. So uh, does anyone want to share what they did for that? I heard some people talking about it, so I know people tried it. Hmm? Sure, yeah, that's good. Okay, so let's split this. Um, can I scroll past the first part of the challenge answer? Okay, let me make a new cell. So for the second part, which was plot the first six, six most common. So if you remember back where we made our data frame that was the most common species, we can do the same sort of thing here. Uh, let's split this into two cells. So if instead of taking n largest four, we take n largest six, ta-da, we get the first six. And then we can just redefine surveys common uh, to be most common species six. So I'm gonna make this a different name just so I don't have two different things. So, yeah, you can also plot it um, if you switch x and y. This will plot weight on the y-axis instead. So if we want it to look similar to what we did before, we can switch y and x like this. Nice. Um, any questions about, about that? Awesome. Okay. Well, let's move on. So uh, we've talked... We're, we're done-ish with factor plot for now. Um, there's some notes in the, in, the, in the notes about how to choose which variables to plot beside each other. In general, you want to plot things that are uh, the most important comparisons should be closer together. So like, for example, splitting things by, by hue here, this comparison is easiest to make visually. The next easiest one is going to be on the same axis. And then if you have more things in different plots, they're going to be harder to compare. So just something to keep in mind if you start chaining together lots and lots of these uh, faceted plots. <clears throat> um, okay, let's go to now talking about before. So here we have one quantitative variable, which is weight. And the rest of the factors here are, are categorical. So they're like labels. Um, we can also compare two quantitative variables, like say weight and height foot length. So let's do that. Um, Let's go back to our surveys below here. Okay, here we go. Let's get surveys.info. So we only have uh, hind foot length and weight that are uh, floats, so they're continuous numbers. These ones that are integers are actually more categorical because they're things like uh, year and plot ID. Um, and then the rest of the things here are these categorical variables as well. So uh, a nice thing to do would be to plot a scatter plot of hind foot length and weight. So, um, oh, before we do that, actually. So we can look at pairwise comparisons of all of the variables that are numerical in this data frame. And there's a really handy Seaborn function called pairplot, sns.pairplot. Oh, first, hold on, before we do that, let's make a subsample of our data set that isn't so big. Otherwise, this plot is going to take a really long time to make. So first, we'll drop, uh, remember from yesterday, we did drop NA to drop all of the records that have any uh, NAND values. Dot sample. 
1,000. So we'll take a subsample of 1,000 points and we'll add this parameter random state equals zero. So sample, uh, the first number here is the number of samples. The second number is just which random seed to use. If you use the same number every time, you'll always get the same random sample. Um, it's generally a good idea to do this when you're taking random data because you can then reproduce your, your random results, basically. Um, you might still want actual random numbers. The random thing? Yeah, yeah, this is the mission of the random and the, yeah, so how the sample works. How the sample works? So uh, sample will give back a data frame that is a random sample of a size 1,000. Is so, it always uh, random, or do I have to set it for random? It is always random, I believe. Like, if you took off this, it would still work. But each time I ran this, I would get a different random sample. Okay. So for reproducibility, basically, it's a good idea to set this parameter. Um, I think you can make this any number, at least in uh, the NumPy random package. It's just a number that it uses to start its random number generator. And if you always start with the same number, it'll always give you the same kind of pseudo-random result. Of course, there are situations in which you actually want it to be differently random every time. But um, if you're just doing something like subsampling or illustrating the effect of some sample, you might want to keep the random state the same every time. This is kind of a side note we can chat about later as well. So now, by setting random state zero, all of us will have the same random subsample of surveys. And now we can make a pair plot. SNS dot pair plot surveys sample. Um, and we don't have to give it anything else besides the data frame because it's going to take everything in the data frame that is numerical and plot them like y versus x. So um, let's run this and see what we get. You'll see that some of them are not uh, super helpful, but some of them have interesting relationships. Put up your blue sticky if this worked. Um, you can also, if you want to, if you know, for example, you don't care about the influence of year or plot ID, you can specify, uh, I believe it's X vowels and Y vowels, which rows and columns you want to actually use in your pair plot. We're just going to leave it like this. Um, and the interesting one, so this one looks neat. This is record ID and year, but it probably has a very simple explanation, which is that the record ID increases over time. So it's a straight line. Um, so we won't look at that, but then, like I said, hind foot length and weight were the two that were uh, continuous, and here we have, these are uh, mirror image, basically, hind foot length versus weight, and vice versa. So let's focus in on this, this particular scatter plot. Um, pair plot is nice to just, if you want to just really quickly get an idea of your data, like, it can be the first thing you do. So uh, there's a function, let's go down now, called lmplot. So it's sort of like factor plot, but it's for two uh, continuous numerical variables instead of for one categorical and one uh, continuous, or one or more categorical. So snf.lmplot. lm stands for linear model because it allows you to fit a regression line as well by default. So let's do x equals weight. Linear model. Okay. Y equals hind foot. Um, I find this name a bit confusing because there are lots of scatter plots I want to make that don't involve linear models, um, which seems obvious to me, but I guess maybe not to be uh, So, again, this is the exact same syntax as we use for violin plot and box plot and factor plot. We specify x and y, and then the data frame. Yeah. Should we use survey uh, because we're only plotting like the two variables, we can just use the whole thing. Yeah. You could do the subsample. Let's see what that looks like. If it's a good representation. Okay. It's pretty small. Let's use the whole thing. So this linear fit is a. Uh, not doing much for me, so let's take it off. 
by default it's there, but we can include the parameter fit reg equals false. I guess fit reg is like fit regression, I think. And now there's no linear fit. So uh, I'll copy this as a comment so you can still see it while we keep going. Oops. I hope I didn't just close it. So also, um, somebody brought this up during the break. If you have like a long list of these uh, arguments and you want to comment one of them out, you can just put a hash. Like if I had this like this. And let's say I wanted to take off or add this parameter, you could just go like this. Although in this case, you'd have to be careful because you bracket at the end still. But uh, that can be a nice way to kind of play around with it. Okay, what were we doing? We were looking at surveys. So basically in this plot, um, let's look at surveys of shape. There are 34,000-ish observations, and there's definitely not 34,000 points in this plot that are visible. So clearly a bunch of them are on top of each other, so we can probably change some parameters to make it look nicer. So if we do another LM plot, again, you can copy and paste because the first part's always the same. X equals weight, Y equals hind foot length. Data equals surveys, hit reg, false. And now, um, because again, because Seaborn is plotting on top of matplotlib, what's actually being plotted here is a matplotlib scatter plot. So there's another argument for Seaborn called scatter KWS, which stands for scatter keywords. And what we can put in here is any keywords that the original underlying scatter plot took as keywords. And the reason why it's specified separately like this is because sometimes there's a lot of parameters and they might conflict with other Seaborn parameters, so you specify it in this kind of separate dictionary. Remember, these are uh, curly braces, which is a uh, dictionary. So we're going to create a dictionary here that has the parameters that we want for the scatter plot. Uh, plot. So there's one called S, which stands for size, with marker size. I'll make that 12. So it's S in quotes colon 12, and then comma. Now, there's another one called alpha. Uh, make this 0 0.4. Alpha is the transparency. It's between 0 and 1. So when I run this, you'll see that now the points are a little bit transparent, so they'll look darker when there's more on top of each other, which is nice. Yeah, that's, that's nicer. You can kind of see, this is just an observation, that there's a bit of, I guess they've been rounding these hind foot lengths because you can see there's like uh, rows here. That means that there's probably like one decimal place maybe. Scatter keywords? Yeah, so underneath lmplot is a function called scatter, matplotlib function called scatter, and that has a bunch of keywords. So if I go now, if I look at, um, Matplotlib scatter. This is the function that um, is being plotted by Seaborn underneath. Like that's what's actually making the scatter plot. So this thing has all these parameters, like S, which we used, and alpha, which we used. So because there's so many, there's like really a lot, and there's all these other ones in this general kind of plotting uh, collection. Uh, Seaborn specifies those in a separate kind of sub list so it doesn't get confused with any of its own parameters. Yeah, so that's, uh, does that make sense? So you can in here put anything that would be passed to the scatter plot 
Um, yeah, and the way to find out what these are, again, I don't remember these things, is to Google like that function. Like what can you put in here? So now you can kind of see, okay, there's like a few clusters here. So we can go back to the idea of the factor plot and try to color them by different things and see what the clusters might mean. So I'm gonna just add one parameter here. Q equals plot type. Um, whenever I add parameters in the function methods, I always forget the comma and then I get an error. So this is a common, common thing that I do. Okay, that's a thing. So this doesn't seem to be splitting into groups like we want. There's some of these plot types are split across all the clusters. They don't kind of group nicely by color. So let's look at our data frame again and see what else uh, could, could explain it. Uh, we're looking for like four to six maybe clusters. So let's look for a thing that has four to six uh, values, unique values. Any questions about this one? Surveys dot and unique. Again, this is this is going to sound like what we did before because it basically is. We got things like taxa um, and maybe species or genus or sex. There's a lot of species or genus, so maybe not, but we'll see. Um, let's look at what we have. You, what are the unique values in taxa? Right, so we got rodent, rabbit, bird, reptile. It makes sense that these things would have different groups of hind foot weight and length. So let's color it by, by those taxa. LM plot again. X equals weight. Y equals hind foot length. Beta equals, oh, first we're gonna color U. Again, the order doesn't matter here. You can switch these arguments up. Okay, so we got uh, hind foot length versus weight, colored by taxa from the survey's data frame without the linear regression line, and we've got some changes to the shape and coloring of the markers. Okay, so interesting. We only have rodents. What happened there? Okay, does anyone know how I could check how many there are in each of the taxa? Again, there's lots of ways to do it. What's one, one way we could check? Survey taxa? And then what? Nice, okay. Okay, so we clearly have mostly rodents, but why do we have, uh, why do we have no other points? So let's see what happens if we drop the NAs. So we can pass to drop NA this argument subset. Um, which will only drop NAs that are in this particular column. So let's see if we drop just the hind foot length NAs and then do the same thing, group by size. Ah, okay. So none of the other taxa actually have any measurements of hind foot length at all, which is why our plot had only rodents in it. 
you have to be answered. Okay, so now taxa, good to know. Let's make a new data frame where we've dropped all the NAs from weight nine foot length, because that's what we're plotting. So we want to get rid of that stuff. Surveys, uh, HF underscore WT, nine foot and weight. Surveys dot drop NA. Okay, so now who can tell me what I should type here to drop uh, just the NA, NAs in the column high foot length and weight? So I want to keep everything. I don't care if there's NAs in the other columns because we're not plotting those right now. I just want to drop NAs in hind foot length and weight columns. So uh, like two brackets? Oh, no. no, I think just one is fine. Let's try. Let's do surveys, HF, and meet. Now we have indeed just one taxa because everything else had no hind foot length or weight measurements. So let's try a different categorical variable now. Let's plot again, sns.lmplot. Let's wait, y plus hind foot length, and foot foot, hind foot length. Q equals, uh, what do you want to try? We have like genus and species left. Put up your blue sticky if you vote genus. Put up your yellow sticky if you vote species. <laughs> Keep typing while you're voting. Yellow for species, blue for genus. Let's like genus ones. Okay, we can do both. We'll do genus first. Ah, huh, okay. Not bad. We can, uh, okay, we can move the legend around a little bit by <clears throat> manually adding a legend. So we'll add, first we'll add uh, legend equals false in the LM plot function. And then on a new line we'll do, oh sorry, hold on. First, let's make an object G or graph, which is this whole entire plot. And now we can do something G dot add underscore legend. And we'll say n call equals two, so two columns. And the font size we can make, say, oh, this is points now, not uh, scale. So you can see just in that example that you can customize a lot of the elements by manually putting them on there. So we did with add legend. And now this G thing is this plot. So if you were to later on, like further down, just call G again, it would just print this plot. Um, it might not have this legend that you might have to reassign it. Any questions about that? Put the blue sticky if you're done typing. And they're using your hands to type really fast. So there are still kind of like, see that these two groups here are labeled with the same genera, but they're clearly two groups. So there's still probably some dividing you can do. Um, Let's look at how many observations, because there's more, there's fewer kind of colors here than there are labels in the legend. So let's look at how many there are for each genus using the size command again. 
Hold on, sorry. Copy this. So using our, our subsetted arrays under square a def underscore wt dot group by genus dot size. So yeah, I mean, they most of them do have observations. Some of them have very few, so it makes sense that there are not very many points. But we can use um, the same idea as factor plot to split into lots of panels for each genus so we can make sure that we can see each one. Placement colors one made which are different Yeah, I mean we have nine and there's really only some of these are kind of similar. Like the pink and the red are too similar, I think. So yeah, we'll split them each genus now into its own plot. So similar to fractal plot. So the first part is the same, just the LM plot thing. X equals weight. Y equals hind foot length. U equals genus. Still calling my genus. Uh, now we're going to add call, same as in factor plot, or we could split into columns. We'll split into columns by genus as well. Call wrap. So this means after three plots, it'll go to a new row. Size, uh, I don't know what this number means, but I usually just try an error to see what looks good. This is what is in the notes. Data equals surveys, H, F, W, T. This is a lot of things on the line. So something that I find myself doing a lot, I don't know if this is a good idea or not, but I end up like having a plot that I like, and then I just copy like this whole statement to like every new thing that I do, and then do it as necessary. So if you end up like, okay, this is the, the type of scatter plot that I like, you can save that code. You can probably actually set the defaults uh, to, to use those parameters though as well. Okay, so we got uh, hind foot length versus weight, colored by genus and split into different plots by genus, and then wrapped so that there's three per uh, row. We're using the surveys HFWT data frame, no linear regression line with these scatter plot keywords. Cool. Okay, so now you can see if you scroll in your own plot, each of those clusters is visible by itself. So because we already colored, we already split into columns by genus, we could just color them by something else, like say species. And then we'll be able to see if the clusters say in the Pudamus are species. I'm just gonna change hue from genus to species and rerun this. Not bad. Okay, so let's do a little challenge. This. In the plot we just made, change the marker type from a circle to a different marker. Um, so there's a link in the notes where you can Google matplotlib markers to see what are the options. Um, and then read the LM plot documentation to see which parameter to change. Again. And can anyone uh, remind me how to look at the help for a function inside Jupyter Lab? Uh, 
There's maybe like a couple ways. So like that's a nice dot. Um, shift uh, Nice. Okay. Any others? Yeah. So Control I uh, opens the inspector if you're in Jupiter no Jupiter Lab. Uh, don't know what this did. Okay, it might not work in my full screen mode, but in your case, if you can drag it over to the right and then it will uh, stay there. You can also do like question mark, plot. show you a bunch of help text. So start with that, I'm gonna put the second part here, a little bonus. So in the second part of the challenge, if you're going to do it, um, make a new plot, and instead of looking at just the clusters for species, look at also the sex, and you can split. Uh, you can split your facets differently if you want. There's a couple ways to do that. Okay, so let's take uh, some minutes for that. Put up your blue sticky when you've done the first part. Um, yeah, and we'll move on after everyone's done the first part. But if you're done early, you can do the bonus as well. Okay, let's uh, let's take this up. So, um, does anyone want to tell me how you changed the marker type? What parameter you changed? Do what? Four. Four? Oh, see, this is my classic mistake. Adding a parameter in the middle and then forgetting the comma. Okay. Markers. Markers. There we go. Let me just Okay, I'm gonna make them a little bit bigger so we can see the see what they look like. Oh neat. Okay, so they're little like biohazardy symbol kind of things. Cool. Awesome. So that's the first part. Um, again, because, yeah, there's no need to memorize things like this. I, I find that I tend to memorize the ones that I use all the time, but then uh, everything else I just look up constantly. So no need to remember like what for actually means or something like that. Okay, how about the second part? Making a different plot uh, to color by or to, to explore what the sex factor looks like. Do you want to say what they did for this? What it started to do? Change the row and pick up the. So if I just copy this. You made a. Uh, sorry, what? I added uh, a sex row once you got the <laughs> So basically, row equals sex? Or? Yeah. Okay. You took a column equal genus? A uh, call graph. So which which of these are you keeping? Call rack. Call I took right. the, the call rack equals good yeah. Yeah? Okay. Um, welcome to my life. Yeah, okay. Ah, excellent question. So bigger, so okay, so let's talk about saving. Um, let's assign this to something G again. 
Does, uh, do you guys know how to save in Seaborn? What's the save? Do you have to do it in you don't save? Uh, you can set the DPI here if you want it to be higher res. Uh, you can change the type by just changing this extension. Does that work? Same as map other. So if you wanted to, as far as appearing bigger in the notebook, the best way would be to split them over multiple rows like we had before. But if you wanted to be like larger or smaller in your um, like final save version, you can do that by changing. Uh, this might come up in the map hot lib section, changing the figure size and stuff like that. Okay, I won't talk about that. But there are ways to change the overall actual size of the figure and things like the font size in relation to that. So if you did this and then you go into the same directory, so if I actually go to files here now, yeah, so here I have this surveys figure. Can I open this? Ah, okay. okay so it's actually really big, but <laughs> I won't look at it. Good question. Any other questions about that uh, part? So, I mean, there's lots of ways you could have answered this question. Like maybe you would want to instead, um, instead of grouping it by genus, you might want to do species instead and then do hue equals sex or something like that. Let's try that. Let's take this off. Put the call wrap back. Uh, the save fig might actually be taking a long time. So if it's taking a long time for you, you can take this out. So when I'm making plots for like a paper, I would just save them as a PDF and then just put them right in. So if I understand this graphs, uh, when you see the sex, can you divide, can you do different colors between male and female on the skill, I think? Because maybe just one color. Yeah, so here I've colored, I've switched the hue to be sex instead of species. Mm -hmm. And instead of splitting the different facets by genus, I'm splitting them by species. Okay. So now, I mean, genus is at a higher level anyway, so it's sort of redundant if we're going to already split by species. So we can, this this might be what you're after. So now uh, the two colors here have a different... Uh, okay. Is, is this what you were after? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, good question. I love scatter plots. I just want to say they're the best plot. Um, I shouldn't say objective thing like that. They are great plots. One thing I love about scatter plots is you can see all the data, which is nice. And even when I'm making like a line plot, often it's just easier to plot markers instead. So I often use scatter plot even if I'm doing a liney thing. Okay. Now the next thing we're going to talk about is. Uh, this will kind of lead into the afternoon, which is going to include more map plotlib. But we can, you can use any any plot within Seaborn using a special um, grid object called facet grid. Um, so everything, every plot we've already done in Seaborn uses a facet grid as its underlying base. So it basically makes a figure like layout an object, and then you can add your data on top of it. So to show, see what this looks like, we can do sns.facet grid, and the capitals are important in this case sensitive. Um, if we just give it this data, and some size for the figure, um, it's going to just 
plot this empty grid. So we haven't yet said like what's X and what's Y and that kind of thing, but it knows that it's going to be doing something with the surveys data. So if this was LM plot, you additionally specified in that plot that it's going to be X is weight, Y is hand length, but so far we haven't actually specified that. So now let's say we're going to do sort of, this might be like a sort of um, not, well, this is interesting to me because I love Macmillan. So we can recreate the same thing that we had before, the scatter plot, using the specifically using Macmillan. So um, I'm going to type that out again. So I'm gonna scroll down. Now to do this, to use Macmillan explicitly, we have to import it. So import matplotlib dot pyplot. So matplotlib itself has this other kind of subfamily called pyplot which we'll just import that specifically as PLT. This is again the convention, PLT is, is the short form for that. Now let's make an object called G, which is gonna be this facet grid, sns.facetgrid. Uh, same thing I had above, data equals surveys, hf, wt, q equals species, size equals five. So this is exactly what I had above, but now we can uh, use a function dot map, which will then plot on here any matplotlib function we want. So we can do plt dot scatter. So scatter is the name of the matplotlib scatter plot. And we use plt because we're using the matplotlib package to call scatter. But because it's within this Seaborn framework, we don't have to give scatter its, and its parameters like in brackets. We can just, uh, yeah, basically they're just passed directly to this map function. So it, it'll, in order the arguments of scatter are x, y, so we'll give weight and hind foot length. Now we can give it some uh, named arguments. So you'll notice this s and this alpha for what we had before in scatter keywords, but now because we're using scatterplot explicitly, we don't have to use that dictionary. We can just give them as if they're normal parameters. Okay, let's run this. So this is uh, going to look exactly the same as it is as before because it's it's the same product, just a slightly different way of phrasing it. But you can see uh, by doing this, and you could replace this with another matplotlib function, like. Uh, Plot. This might not work. These parameters aren't going to work anymore. The plot is a line plot in matplotlib. This looks bad because none of these are in order. <laughs> so uh, let's go back to scatter. Uh, one thing that's good to keep in mind about matplotlib is that different plotting functions have different parameters. So, like the s parameter is size of marker in a scatter plot, but it's not marker size in a line plot. You can add markers to a line plot, but it's a different argument, a different parameter, which is uh, confusing, but that's something to keep in mind. So now let's, uh, let's make a line plot. Um, and we'll look at how the number of animals uh, of each species varies over time. Because remember we had year was one of the, or uh, like date was one of the variables. Okay, so we'll go back to our survey's common data set, um, which we had at the beginning. If you if you remade it to have six species, that's okay. This will still be fine. So let's look at what we've got for each species by year. Survey's common, vector by, by year. Group by species, and I'll group by sex. Size. Okay, these are these are good numbers. So we can make this uh, output into a data frame and then start plotting it. So um, this right now, it's not kind of formatted like a data frame. It's a series object. So let's quickly scroll down. Uh, maybe it's just integers. 
we can reset the index to make it a data frame. So let's call this thing species per year. I'm going to put this in brackets so I can split stuff on multiple lines. So because this, this result here is what we actually want to keep, I'm going to keep the dot size and everything like that. Dot size dot uh, reset index. That's the function. And then finally, okay, let's do this first. And look at what we get. This is good. Um, now we have a new index, is reset index. But there's this last column uh, that didn't have a name before because it was given to us by size. So we can rename this column in this original statement to make it size, which is uh, reasonable. Okay, so now below reset index, do dot rename columns equals. This is a dictionary. So column, the column that's now named zero, we'll rename it size. So if I run this and then look at it again, now it's been renamed size. Put up your blue sticky if you're there. So because this data is longitudinal, so we have years and then we have some numbers, it makes sense to plot as a line plot, so that's what we'll do. And uh, Seaborn doesn't currently have a dedicated line plot, but the next version will. Is that correct? Yes, so we're gonna use facet grid and the map other line plot, but eventually you would be able to do this just in Seaborn. Can you remind me again what's that uh, rename columns? Uh, yeah. Command? Yeah, so let's, uh, if I just run this part here. Um, this column got named zero, just because it was a new column that we made. Now we're adding this rename column. So it took this one that was called zero and renames it size. Um, Does that make sense? So if you look at, okay, let's. How do you do that? Oh, okay, columns name zero. Yeah, so if you look at this thing and then do dot columns, let's say. The column names are a year, it's two sex, and zero. We want zero to be called size instead. So now we're going to use dot rename and then say the columns should be updated with this, this change. Yeah. Make this less huge. Okay, I'm going to keep this so we can keep looking at it and then make our facet plot, facet grid. And we'll call it G. If you wanted to keep using all of your plots kind of further on, you could name them different things. We're using G all the time, you can make them unique. So now we're using our new data frame species per year. That's what these two will set um, how wide and tall the plot is, respectively. And now we're going to use map again and use plt.plot, which is what I showed you above. It looked really terrible, but now it's going to look good, hopefully, because this makes sense to plot. Uh, we'll plot year as the x-axis and size as the y-axis. OK, uh, it does not look good. So I, I didn't understand what, what was happening here when I first looked at this, but does anyone know? Does anyone have a guess why this looks weird? It took me a minute. Scroll back up to this, might give you an idea. So basically what's happening is that for each year, there's a bunch of observations. There's a bunch of different species. 
and it doesn't it's just plotting them all in order like it's making a line that goes through all the date all the numbers in x97 that goes to x 78 just it doesn't know how to split them up so we can tell it to split them by uh species and we can use the seaborn-esque uh, syntax for this so back up here in our facet group we can say call equals species um, which is a little oh no sorry wait we want to do that yet q equals species that's what we want q equals species and now this is this is better now each species has its own line so you can right away see stuff that we didn't know before like for example this species whatever it is is only started being collected in 1995. So we can add a legend. We saw this earlier, g.add legend font size equals 10. Okay, so this Bailey A species was collected more recently or only appeared in 1995. We don't know which one. Any questions about this plot? Put up your blue sticky if you're finished. If you're ready to go forward. Okay. So within FASA group, we can do the same sort of thing as before and split it into multiple plots for each of these things. So before, when I start typing column, that's what that would have done. So let's uh, go to a new one here. This will be very similar to what I had above. So you can copy and paste if you like. G equals SNS dot facet grid data species here. Call equals species. Uh, we'll still color it by species. Uh, we'll split them into two columns, two rows, or sorry, two per column. You got map. So, um, Again, this is a seaborne way of doing things where this underlying function, call it staying the same. Like we're always plotting size versus year. We just want to change like the layout and which categorical variables we're exploring. Now we have four plots instead of all these lines in the same plot. Um, it's sort of like up to you how you want to present stuff like this. In this format, we can now do something like, okay, let's now split by a different variable like sex. So instead of coloring by species, let's color by sex. And that's really the only change we have to make. If I run that again, now we have split by sex. And this is something that would take um, a few more changes if you were plotting this just with Matplotlib. Okay, let's finish with the challenge. It's almost lunchtime. Um, okay, copy this. So for the challenge, calculate the mean weight per year for all species together and plot it in a line plot. So the mean, uh, so instead of multiple plots for each species, this will just be uh, one line for everything. You can use uh, either the whole entire data set, you can use the survey's common or the whole thing. Whichever strikes your fancy. And oh, 
Thomas. Calculate the mean weight per year for each species individually. So the reason why this is not what we've already done is that we were plotting the number of species and now you want to plot the mean weight. So the second part here will be very similar to what we already did except for that instead of the size or the count, we want to plot the mean weight. So that's, a, that's not something that might, maybe you can do in 10 minutes, but feel free to kind of pick away at it <laughs> over lunch if you're around, um, but no pressure to do this just if you're if you want to. Um, I will actually, I'll wrap it up here now then. You can either leave for lunch now, come back at one for the afternoon, or you can stay a bit and work on the challenge. Are there any questions, generally? Okay, awesome. Thanks everyone.